You're listening to the QSR Web Podcast. Hello, and welcome back to the weekly QSR Web Podcast. I'm your host, QSR Web and Pizza Marketplace editor, Shelley Whitehead. And I am absolutely delighted you've joined us today. We're starting the podcast this time with some great information from an interview with restaurant employee scheduling software provider, Seven Shifts, and its CEO, Jordan Bush, today. Then we'll move right along into the second segment with the latest on the QSR comeback kid, Fazoli's, and its turnaround CEO, Carl Howard who stops by to talk about the unusual QSR's path forward. So stay with us. We'll be right back. Labor costs are on the rise. Next week's schedule isn't finished yet, and you're in the middle of training new staff. In a restaurant, time is limited, to-do lists are long, and margins are thin. Seven Shifts is here to help. By taking the work out of scheduling, labor management, and team communication, we help restaurant operators and their staff reclaim their time and save money doing it. With seven shifts, staff availability, team chat, and shift notes are all in one place. Get started today at sevenshifts.com. All right, now we're back. So let's broach what is, for most QSR operators today, a very touchy subject, and that is labor, and more specifically, labor cost. Just about everywhere nationally, they're on the rise. For QSR brand leaders, it's just one more thing to try to squeeze out of that once juicy sponge filled with restaurant revenues. There is help, though, through the right tools, which is what today's sponsor, Seven Shifts, is all about. Today, the restaurant employee scheduling software company's CEO, Jordan Bush, is on hand to delve a little deeper into this subject and some of its solutions. Welcome, Jordan, and thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. My pleasure. So let's just start just on a general level and find out what you, as the leader of a company that constantly communicates with restaurateurs, See is the biggest issue or issues facing restaurants now and in the immediate future. Yeah, the the biggest challenges that we see restaurants facing, I mean, there are so many challenges that they face day to day, whether it relates to inventory, uh, labor, and just kind of keeping track of all these all these ever changing uh, things in their life. So we see we see labor as a massive challenge. There's no no question about that. And that's, you know, we, we solve for that pain point directly by offering over 10,000 restauranters a labor management product where they can, you know, help reduce their labor costs, schedule to the right uh, levels of optimal labor. And on the flip side, also engage staff through the process. So we believe that it's kind of a twofold process of you know, making sure the business needs are met, uh, but also making sure your staff are getting the shifts that they want and, you know, that kind of relates to the retention and longevity of your of your staff. So I would say today it is centered around labor, uh, but I think as we go into 2019, it's just going to get a little bit more intense uh, because we're already seeing this shift of folks in New York introducing New York Fair Work Week regulations, seeing it Oregon just passed their fair their their version of Fair Work Week, and uh, California's already been you know, pretty, pretty strict around labor laws as well. So I think in, in 2019, because there are these, these laws rolling out at such a rapid pace and people are kind of following suit, I feel like there's, they're going to be, there's just going to be more of a focus on trying to make sure you're compliant and, you know, paying out staff accordingly if you're breaking these violations. So I think we're actually going to see some major brands potentially get sued as it relates to violating some of these labor laws, because I don't know if people understand the magnitude of it quite yet, because it hasn't, there, there's kind of almost been like no one that's been made an example of yet, but it's coming. And I feel that folks that really understand the nuances and, and how serious this, this can be are, are looking for ways to manage it and get it, get in front of it. Wow. It's kind of a, kind of a little bit scary uh, when you talk about it and you know, it has to be because the landscape seems to be so it's up and down depending on where you are. Um, now, with the restaurant staff turnover rate, uh, uh, 
as I understand it, now pegged at more than 70 percent, which, by the way, is the highest of any North American industry. Can you tell us what restaurant operators can do to proactively retain staff? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll just start with some some stats here. I mean, 73% is, is obviously astronomically high, and it's it's only gotten higher over time. But I think what's really interesting is turnover costs restaurateurs about $3,500 on average. Oof. And there's a lot of studies out there around that, and it could be it could be higher depending on on where they're from. But just think about that $3,500 for a second. If $3,500 worth of produce walked out of your fridge, would you care? <laughs> like, would you, would you, would you be checking? Like, I'm assuming you'd be checking cameras. You'd be figuring out who was working that shift, where did all the lettuce go and the ham. And like, it's a big thing. But what's, what I find really interesting is 90% of restaurant managers actually don't do exit interviews. So people are walking out and they actually don't know why. Um, and so, we're, I'm not shocked by the turnover rate. There are certain factors that contribute to it. Yes, there are younger folks that are going back to school. But if you, we surveyed our, our customers around um, some of the biggest reasons why people stay at a job or leave, and the biggest reason was their coworkers and, mm-hmm. the, and the flexibility of work. So, you know, a lot of people like to say, oh, it's because of the pay that pays low. Um, that's one factor, but we're seeing that it's more around who they're working with, the culture of the restaurant, and having flexibility in their job. So if, if you can, you know, if you think about it, if you can make a little bit more across the street at, a, you know, say 10 cents more an hour or 15, like you're probably not going to jump to that job if you really like the people you work with at your existing uh, uh, QSR. So that's, I just wanted to call that out as kind of like, you know, that that's obviously these are factors that contribute to the turnover rate. What I think restaurateurs and, and operators can do about it is, is uh, you know, Danny Meyer talks about this from Union Square Hospitality Group a lot, where 90% of it is hiring and 10% is training. And I think one thing that's really important to remember is there's no right way um, to train the wrong person. Yeah. So if you're not hiring someone that's going to fit into your culture and your values and your norms at, at, your, at your place of work, then, you know, you can't train that into them. So I think the biggest step that folks need to, to look at is hiring for the right fit, first and foremost. And you know, that might mean establishing your core values. And, you know, I, I talk about some exercises that operators can do to do this. So, you know, step one is, is kind of like an if I could clone three people, who, who would they be? Step two is identify their key traits. You know, why would you clone them? Why do you want more of these types of individuals? What makes them so special? Um, collaborative voting, you know, maybe bring these individuals in and, and say, hey, you know, we want more of you, you guys. We want people that have your traits. You know, here's what we, here's what we wrote on the whiteboard, and let's vote on these, and and define them and, and refine them, and then and then roll it out to the company. And and I think it's it's really important that you have buy-in and transparency from your staff that are maybe you feel like they're bought into this process. It just helps with the culture. Um, I think at the end of the day. Operators need to know that they're hiring, firing, and promoting by the, the set of values that they have in their in their place of work. So, it's an exercise that people have to do that I, that people just aren't doing. And, and it's not even just specific to the QSR restaurant space. It's really agnostic. You know, businesses, all businesses should be doing this. Uh, yet people don't. Yeah. Um, and then you know, you've, you so you've hired for the right fit. It's the biggest thing. You know, um, based on your core values. And the next step once in the door, yeah, now it's training them, now it's engaging them. And, you know, people often think of engaging their staff as kind of this black box, like, what does engagement mean? What does it truly mean? How do I measure it? <laughs> and it's really, it's really simple. Like, you know, we're, we're people. Like, take interest in your people. If you hire a server or a bartender and, and you know, you learn about them and it turns out they, they like photography and you're revamping your menu – ask them to take pictures of the menu, you know, like it's small stuff like that, that I think can go a long way. Emphasizing team collaboration is another thing. So as it relates to engaging the workforce more. So I think as an example, if your bartender is, uh, or if you're revamping your bar menu and you're adding more cocktails, well, you know, maybe have a competition and people vote on the best drinks that get put on the menu, but you can make it fun and collaborative. And so 
providing opportunities for advancements, another one, ongoing training, keeping schedules flexible. These are all things that people can do to try and keep their folks engaged. Um, it's, but it really, really, if I could just summarize, it really comes back to hiring for the right fit. Um, and it's just something that people just don't take enough time in doing. And I think it, you know, the, the, the QSR and restaurant space is a, a bit of a revolving door because of it, because people think, oh, I just need, I need people so fast. I got to hire, I got to hire. Yeah. But at what cost? So is there a way that you can, is there a way that you can invest a little bit more time, hire a bit more slowly, but get someone that's going to actually be with you more longer term if you have the right questions that you're asking them and processes that you're putting them through? What great ideas you have. Uh, it's fun to listen to, to some of the thoughts you have about how to really um, enhance that hiring process to find the right people. Finally, what would you suggest restaurant leadership Keep in mind or even implement to cut labor costs now. So I think re uh, restaurant leadership should be implementing some sort of labor management process to, to, to help control it. I think the biggest problem is that people just don't, a lot of folks are stuck in their bad habits. So managers and operators are kind of stuck in this mindset of, I've been doing it the same way for X amount of years and my dad or, you know, my brother, they did it this way, and this is how I do it. And I think it, it really takes, you just need to take a step back and say, this is just how it's been done, but is it the right way that we should be managing labor and, 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 and scheduling it? And there are tools out there, um, you know, like Seven Shifts, that, that can help with this. You know, we, we analyze multiple schedules that you've been building, and we look for optimal points, of, and we try and we use some, some tools in the background to understand and optimize where your best times were, where you scheduled, where you hit your labor target, where you hit your sales per labor hour. And we try and you know, help you help guide you over time to make those small enhancements. So there's uh, there, there are tools out there. Seven just is one of them, um, which is obviously where, you know, where, what our company does, but I think just in general, the, there's, the, the, there are things out there to help you manage your labor more appropriately, but look for tools that not only help you build a schedule, it should go beyond that. It should go into engaging your staff. It should look at, you know, without an engaged staff, you, you can't get the right data into the scheduling process to build a good schedule. If staff aren't engaged and they're not submitting your availability, your schedule is never going to be right. So make sure that you have tools where you can work on both ends. You can have a they highly engage the staff and keep them um, motivated to, to, you know, be involved and collaborate through these channels, um, whether it's through mobile apps or, or any other means, but also having a tool for the managers where they can see things in real time that integrate with the point of sale and, uh, and allow real time sales and labor to, to flow through to, to give you more insights. I think there's, we have so much data, but the, the point isn't that we just have lots of it. It's really comes down to how do we synthesize that data to help restaurant operators make decisions um, and help keep staff engaged and retain them for a longer period of time. Yep, uh, the, the amount of data can be a little bit overwhelming at times, knowing how to make it work, I would imagine is um, a challenge. Um, you know, Absolutely. this is, yeah, <laughs> you speak as one who knows, huh? <laughs> I tell you what, this has been great information. And uh, again, I just want to mention the company and our sponsor today is Seven Shifts, which even offers a free trial at sevenshifts.com. And I want to thank you, Jordan, and also our listeners. And remind them to please stay tuned because up next is our featured restaurateur of the day, Fazoli CEO Carl Howard, right after this. Labor costs are on the rise. Next week's schedule isn't finished yet, and you're in the middle of training new staff. In a restaurant, time is limited, to-do lists are long, and margins are thin. Seven Shifts is here to help. By taking the work out of scheduling, labor management, and team communication, we help restaurant operators and their staff reclaim their time and save money doing it. With Seven Shifts, staff availability, team chat, and shift notes are all in one place. Get started today at sevenshifts.com.
Last year must have been one big Italian celebration for Fazoli's, which had its 30th birthday as a brand and marked 10 years with a fellow at the helm who has made a huge difference in the brand's fate. And that is, of course, our guest today and Fazoli CEO, Carl Howard, who is here in the flesh to give us the latest on this pasta plumped brand. And welcome, Carl. Delighted to have you here today. Yes, yeah, Shelley, thank you so much. It's great to be on and uh, looking forward to our call. Give us the current read on where Fazoli's is as far as number of locations and geographic reach now as compared to 10 years earlier when you were first starting at the chain. Okay, sure. So we're at 216 uh, locations now. and We're mainly a Midwest-based chain. The majority of our locations are in Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee, Missouri, uh, Texas, Georgia, and that probably, that group right there probably is where 80% of our locations are more located. So, you know, we're fairly regional with the exception of, uh, you know, Texas on the west coast of Texas. We uh, have quite a few restaurants where we do very well. So let's um, look a little closer, if we can, at the brand's metamorphosis since your arrival. How has it changed and grown over that period? And and really, what has your leadership at the brand taught you about the limited service industry today? Sure. So the the brand, when I started, unfortunately, was really in a dire situation. The franchisees were not happy. The business was uh, seeing double-digit sales declines. And we were closing restaurants, not opening them. And there was just a lot of work that needed to be done it was a great opportunity uh, for me. I kind of came from another turnaround situation. And, you know, I, I went back to the same playbook. The first thing I wanted to do was study the, 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 the consumer or our guest and find out why they come, what would make them come more often, why they're leaving, and, you know, kind of put a game plan together from there. And I, I learned quite a bit from that information. Uh, I also studied, I think I probably had six feet worth of brand decks and information that when I was in training that I had next to my hotel bed and I just went through it and trained myself and learned the brand and, you know, quickly came to realize that there was a, a couple different areas that we needed to focus on. And first and foremost was really our food quality and uh, presentation. So we went through and uh, did a major upgrade of our food including putting a lot you know everything from more dairy into uh, our alfredo sauce doing uh fresh cold press uh the marinara and uh and and that's just the beginning i mean we changed our chicken product we stopped cooking uh, uh, items ahead we used to cook items and hold them for 20 minutes waiting for the guests to come in so we went to on-demand cooking and the brand went for a short period of time well about a year, it went from um, minus 10 to flat. And everybody, I can still remember, I remember this day like it was yesterday, everybody was so happy that you know, we just finished up the year flat. And I'm, I'm like, gang, we're, we're minus 10 on the two year and on the three year, it's worse than that. So you know, <laughs> we haven't, uh, we have got a long way to go. And so again, I did another consumer study. And what I found out is that the guests really didn't appreciate the food changes as much as I was expecting them to. So we stopped the bleeding, but we didn't necessarily thrive from this change. So really as a consumer of Fazoli's going into the restaurants on a a pretty regular basis as the CEO, you know, I always struggled with serving our food on foam plates and uh, foil baking tins and plastic silverware. And so I re- remember, again, sitting in a, a conference room with the senior team saying, hey, we're going to go in a different direction, and we're going to go with uh, traditional plateware and silverware, and we're going to run the food out to the table versus giving them a pager. And we did a, a light re- refresh, thirty-five to 50000 in paint only, and a little bit of decor, and the brand took off. We, I think we, after that, we went positive 10, and we were up 18 out of 19 quarters. We were up 88 out of 93 months, and the most of the months that we were down had something to do with weather, just being regionalized. You can get hit pretty hard. And we really started to take off. And, you know, then we started to put together the effort to refranchise and grow the Fazoli's brand. 
It is a long, hard path, isn't it? Even when it's done fairly quickly, as you have over those 10 years. Um, it's just tough to, I guess it's tough to keep everybody engaged with the effort. Yeah, so it's it's important that, uh, you know, you have buy-in from, your team, but you know, also the franchisees, which to me is the, the most critical thing. If the franchisees are not buying into it, then you're not doing something correct. And uh, I'm a former franchisee, so I, I kind of understood where they were coming from when I started. I mean, they were uh, losing money and and putting money into the business. And yeah, I mean, the first two years were very challenging. We had not only um, to recreate basically the the, the entire menu and how we cook food, but we also, uh, you know, had to reduce uh, some locations. And, you know, that was, those were the final two or three years of where really we saw some uh, restaurant closures. And you know, what we did to get everybody's buy-in is we just were very methodical about testing. So we went into the Dayton, Ohio market. I happen to be I, from Dayton. I grew up in Dayton. So uh, they always treat me very kind in, in, in that market. So, so we, that's where we did a lot of our original testing. We still do today. And, you know, the press was really great uh, from the business paper to the TV to the radio station. I mean, everybody kind of picked it up. Local boy done good. And, um, you know, that the, the restaurants took off. And then we started to roll it out to another company market in Lexington. And it did well. And, you know, from there we put a, a plan together and actually borrowed some money um, from the owners of the brand at the time, Sun Capital, uh, we borrowed uh, funds directly from the two principals of that company, and because uh, we 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 showed them the results, and we did all the company restaurants, and then the franchisees started to follow along. We really did not have to uh, push them into compliance or, you know, strong arm anyone. They saw the results, and the smart franchisees went early, and then before you know it, everybody went and. and you know, franchisees had a lot of success. And um, so it, it is a lot of work and it takes a little bit of time. You, you can't go in and make radical changes without having, you know, your true North Star guiding you, which is the consumer. And you really need to go and validate things for the franchisees because they have their life's, you know, stake at this. I mean, if the, some of these, uh, some of our franchisees and I have become very close and fond with them, I mean, this is their entire livelihood. Now, you're rolling out a menu refresh and store remodels, if I'm correct now. Uh, can you can you give us an update on the status of that and how the new menu is being received, as well as what sure. your remodels are doing for business now? Yeah, so the, the new menu has been in place for three quarters of the year, and it's it's doing great. Doesn't We're not making any modifications to the, the menu, and uh, you know, s somebody joked around, so this will probably be your last menu change, won't it? And the only reason <laughs> I said that, it, it, it took it took us about 12 times, 12 different tests to get it right. We were on, we call it menu 3.0, and we were on menu 3.0i or H before we rolled it out. And, and uh, so, you know, we really fine-tuned it before we rolled it out to the system, and it's, and it's doing well. There, our, our food quality is just so good, and it's only going to get better. We have uh, like eight or nine projects right now that we're working on from everything as minute as our mushroom, our sausage, um, all the way to how we rebuild the lasagna or rework our chicken Parmesan so it has more flavor. So we've done a few different versions of the remodel. And, you know, we went out and said, okay, if I, uh, this is more of my direction. If I could have any remodel that I want, this is how I would do it. And it was very expensive. So, I mean, we squared off the buildings, ripped off the mansard roof, made, brought everything up to 2020 ADA compliance and health codes. And we put $400,000 into the facilities and sales went up 10%. That's great. But the return on investment was just a little bit too long. So we went to work on another version, which we did last year. And so we were able to get it down to 330,000. So, 20% declines uh, in cost, sales r remain roughly the same. The ROI still wasn't good enough. So 
We are now rolling out uh, 10 more uh, remodels on the company side, which we refer to as our, our skinny good remodel. And we've got one done and it's doing very well. We have two franchisees that are actively remodeling their locations now. We have another one that's getting ready to start. And our facilities are just night and day difference. And every metric that you can think of when we remodel these facilities improve. So turnover drops. It's, uh, 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 this is going to be a number that the people are going to listen to and say, no way. Turnover drops a, a, about 50%. Oh. People love working in the new environment, and it's fresh, and it's cool. Uh, overall guest satisfaction, our star rating goes up by seven-tenths of a percent, seven-tenths of one star. That's a huge increase from a, an overall star rating. So if you can go from an average of 3.9 to 4.6, you know, that's really good because a four seven star rating is just about as high as you can you can go. There's some brands that are higher than that, but there there's not many. You know, at QSR Italian is kind of a sparsely populated field. I wonder why you think there aren't more players like Fazoli's. What perhaps the challenge in this niche is? Sure. Well, the interesting thing with Italian, although I think it's easy to operate, most the uh, franchise and, and, and startups find it very challenging to really get the, the process and the flow done. And against why Olive Garden doesn't have any major competitors. I mean, they're much larger than the, the second largest player to them. I mean, they're p- probably pushing a thousand units and the next largest casual themed dining restaurant, I'm sure doesn't even have a hundred. So the Italian in general, is just a little bit uh, uh, tricky to do it and to do it well. But you do do it. But then again, can you do it well in the increasingly off-premise restaurant economy we're in today? We have spent the last six months refining every single to-go uh, box that we have, and we've changed every single piece of uh, uh, food presentation as and to-go where. And you know, our, our conversation with the franchisees is we need to be just a pa- as passionate about the takeout business as we are our dining business because. We offer a lot of service after the point of sale that other brands at our price point do not offer. I mean, we're very close to a, almost a casual themed dining restaurant once you come in. And yeah. so we put a lot of a lot of attention towards just making sure that the products carry well and then when they get home, they're really good. I mean, we've got uh, seal-proof containers, so sauce cannot drip out of them. And we've investment spend into that as well. I mean, it's more expensive using these type of to go wear, but uh, people have to have a great experience when they get the product. Well, I um, very much appreciate your stopping in to talk today. I hope maybe we can circle back around in a year or so and find out about that at home strategy that um you know off-premise strategy for you and how it's changed and where you all are taking it is that a deal sure. <laughs> absolutely i'd be i'd be honored to talk about it we've got a lot of things uh in the works right now and we'll find out a year from now how many of those have unfolded deal and hopefully our listeners will be with us then just as they are now As we wrap up this edition of the QSR Web Podcast, but not without wishing everybody a tremendous weekend and an even better business week ahead. Bye-bye now.